Hello class, uh, this is the second video discussing the endocrine system and we're going to talk about now this, uh, we, we previously talked about how hormones don't cause behaviors and emotional states, they increase the likelihood of, increase or decrease the likelihood of a specific uh, behavior or emotional state given the appropriate context and how behaviors and emotions influence hormones and how hormones influence behaviors and emotions. Now we're going to discuss um, another foundational concept in um, endocrinology, uh, and it's this. Uh, hormones organize and activate. So let's talk about these individually, and I'll give you examples of what I mean. So let's talk about an example of activational effects this behavior that you see here is called lordosis. Lordosis is a, a posture that's exhibited by many different mammal species by sexually receptive females. Um, if you've ever had a, uh, a dog or a cat before, a lot of cats exhibit this behavior um, um, to a certain degree if you, if you rub them on their lower back near their tail. Um, but it's very extreme in females uh, that are in the middle of their estrus cycle. Um, commonly, we commonly term this heat um, in our um, domestic uh, pets and livestock. And so um, when females are in their estrus cycle, they exhibit this extreme behavior. Um, and as you see below, this is a behavior that's um, important for um, soliciting and facilitating copulations uh, from males, uh, which is what you see below. The, the black cat is the uh, male, and the uh, calico cat on the bottom is exhibiting uh, lordosis behavior. Now, uh, lordosis is under hormonal control. Uh, this diagram here that you see on the left of a, of a rat, you don't have to uh, memorize. Um, but uh, it, it, it's a diagram that shows the, the very general pathway of how estrogens, specifically estradiol, um, plays an important part in mediating this behavior. If you remember, um, based on our, one of our first principles, the hormones don't cause this behavior, but it certainly facilitates it. You, you don't see this behavior without estradiol, but you don't see the same behavior um, just with, with just estradiol. Just injecting estradiol isn't going to cause this behavior. It also requires a specific context olfactory cues from male pheromones uh, and also tactile stimulation uh, on the lower back above the tail uh, in this context and in high concentrations of circulating estradiol uh, mammals will exhibit this uh, behavior Experiment done a long time ago. Uh, Bowling, Young, and Dempsey, done in uh, guinea pigs, 1938. They overactomized guinea pigs, uh, and this means that they removed their ovaries. Uh, and this is the primary site of estrogen synthesis in the female guinea pig. And so adult guinea pigs that are overectomized do not exhibit lordosis, even in response to male solicitation. So in the response to those contextual cues, olfactory, tactile stimulation, a mature male, uh, they still don't, don't exhibit lordosis. So these hormones are seemingly um, 
important. Taking this step further, if you remember when we discussed the paradigm, the gold standard in experimentation and endocrinology, is if you think a hormone is responsible or plays a part in a specific behavior, remove the hormone, the behavior should disappear. Remove the hormone and replace the hormone, then the behavior should reappear. Uh, and that's exactly what they did. They overectomized females so that they could not produce their own endogenous estradiol and then injected them with estrogen and progesterone, um, another hormone that's that increases during uh, the estrus cycle. Uh, and the guinea pigs show lower doses when paired with a sexually experienced male and has those other associative cues, olfactory and tactile stimulation. So lower doses is an example of activational effects. Hormones also have organizational effects. This means that they can influence um, what uh, anatomically and physiologically what the adult phenotype body is going to look like. And as extension um, behavior and emotional states, it could um, influence, it, influence that uh, indirectly through the development of the nervous system and the endocrine system. Um, so uh, you may, uh, we have this uh, notion in biology um, that uh, DNA is a blueprint uh, and it gives you instructions for what what the organism is going to look like as an adult. Um, but this is, uh, if you've been in a class with me before, you've likely have heard me talk about this. This is, uh, is a bit of a fallacy. There is, DNA does not give rise. There's not one blueprint, but a whole host of possible, possible outcomes. Uh, the, the DNA gives us a, a certain restrictions on what's possible, um, but its DNA is more akin to, let's say, a, a cookbook, uh, and depending on its interaction with the environment, you'll get suddenly different um, uh, dishes. I mean, the, the, the recipe, the ingredients can be mixed in different ways. And so just having the genes themselves doesn't give us a blueprint of what the adult's going to look like because these genes uh, need to be turned on and turned off and for certain amounts of time, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. And hormones uh, influence this through their ability to affect transcription, turning on and off hormones. And so, I'm sorry, turning on and off genes. Uh... And so uh, thyroid hormones, for example, have profound organizational effects during early development in mammals, both in utero um, and then also uh, after birth, um, while the organism is still a, a, a neonate or, or juvenile. Uh, and so does the steroid hormones, estrogens, testosterone, other androgens, um, Glucocorticoids, like cortisol, can have profound organizational effects, uh, affecting the steroid hormones, can have profound effects on the shape, the uh, architecture of the nervous system, literally a density of neurons, the size of certain areas in the brain, um, receptor density in both the nervous and endocrine system, which can have uh, later uh, behavioral consequences in the adult phenotype. So if this rambling isn't very clear, let me give you an example of a simple example of steroid hormones, sexual behavior from a study not quite as long ago, but still uh, a long time ago. 
again with guinea pigs. Male guinea pigs were castrated at birth. Um, and so they um, saw a little bit of testosterone in utero, uh, but they did not see the, uh, the increase of testosterone concentrations that they normally would when they were neonates, juveniles, ones that are important in the development of, of, of uh, secondary uh, secondary sex characteristics. And so males that are castrated uh, at birth exhibit lordosis if you inject them with estrogen and progesterone. Uh, they're not making testosterone, but they're also not making estrogen and progesterone at high concentrations because they don't have ovaries. But if you inject them with exogenous estrogens and progesterone, they will exhibit lordosis. On the other side of the coin, females prenatally exposed to testosterone did not exhibit lordosis even if you injected them with estrogen and progesterone so in this diagram here it illustrates this showing the male uh, what typically happens is the male neonate <coughs> in juvenile experiences a surge of endogenous testosterone produced by their own testes, which, uh, and later we've worked out a lot of this proximate mechanism, sets into motion uh, the, the neuroendocrine um, architecture um, for typical male mating behavior, um, which is um, producing pheromones in their urine, spraying urine, seeking out females, and mounting receptive females, uh, and copulating. Yet, if you simply castrate them, like we saw with the uh, Capones and the rooster, they don't exhibit this behavior. Uh, and in fact, if you inject them with exogenous estrogen and progesterone, they show lordosis, which is a behavior that's uh, a, a typical behavior of female guinea pigs. Um, and again, with the females, if you sort of mirror the effects of having testes during early development by injecting, injecting young neonate females with testosterone, this affects their organization of their nervous system and endocrine system in such a way that if you um, um, they they won't exhibit testosterone, so they they don't have the architecture. Right? They won't exhibit lordosis. They don't have the architecture, neural or endocrine architecture, for facilitating that behavior, even with the appropriate context and hormones. Um, but they will, in fact, if you inject them with testosterone as adults, uh, they will exhibit typical male behavior. Uh, they will seek out and. Um, mount uh, females that are showing lordosis. Um, and so with, with a simple exposure to uh, during certain uh, sensitive windows during early development, um, you can produce sort of the, the neural architecture that's required for these behaviors that are typically male and female uh, specific. Um, so this illustration on the right shows both the organizational effects, the hormones given or taken away during early development, and also the activational effects, the injection of these, uh, of these hormones later in life to exhibit an atypical response for their sex. So, in general, specific to or uh, sex steroids, estrogens and androgens. Male typical vertebrates experience an early surge of androgens from the fetal testes. This also happens in utero uh, or in ovo, depending on what class you are. Right? Uh, there's no, um, you don't gestate inside of a uterus if you're a bird, you gestate inside of an egg. And these steroid hormones do not, uh, not only influence the development of the body, um, but also the brain. 
And so we're going to take a look at a, a, an example of this in birds now. The profound organizational effects of androgens in the songbird, very briefly. The avian song learning system. So among most passerine birds, males will sing to defend territories and attract males. Uh, this singing is different from what we hear around this time of year, which would be classified as calls. Uh, singing is a more robust, intricate repertoire of multisyllable notes. We hear a lot in the spring. Uh, and this is hormonally driven, hormonally activated with surges of testosterone, uh, with increasing day length, which is what drives it, which is what we get when we transition from winter to spring. But it's also under uh, organizational effects, too. Males develop specialized brain structures that are necessary for the song learning process. And this is driven by exposure to testosterone. Now, <coughs> I want to show an example of uh, one of the most famous male bird songs. And while you're listening to this bird, you can think about um, how this behavior is not found in uh, the females. And, uh, uh, and how this uh, male has specialized brain structures that are um, uh, that are uh, developmentally uh, uh, reduced in uh, the female brain. He clears a space in the forest he to serve as his concert forest, platform. To serve as his concert platform. To persuade females to come close to and admire his plumes, he sings the most complex song he can manage. And he does that by copying the songs of all the other birds he has around him, such as the cuckoo. Such as the kookaburra. It's a very convincing impersonation. It's a very convincing impersonation. Even the original is fooled. Even the original is fooled. He can imitate the calls of at least he can twenty imitate the calls different species. Of at least Twenty different species. He also, in his attempt to outsing his rivals, in his attempt incorporates to other sounds that he hears in the forest. Other sounds that he hears in the forest. That was a camera shutter. That was a camera shutter. And again. And again. And now a camera with a motor drive. And now a camera with a motor drive. And that's a car alarm. And that's a car alarm. And now the sounds of foresters and, and their chainsaws working nearby. And now the sounds of foresters and their chainsaws working nearby.
So that was a pretty spectacular example of song learning in a bird species. Among our birds that must learn their song, their vocalizations, include hummingbirds, parrots, and a group that we call the ossines, which is a, a subclade within the passerines. <coughs> Pictured here is our model passerine, the zebra finch, a model organism that's been studied uh, extensively, not only as a model for a model for birds, but also a model for vertebrates, including humans. Uh, we have a midge, uh, an illustration of a mid sagittal section of their brain. A male zebra finch brain on the top, and a typical female zebra finch brain at the bottom, and highlighted in circles are different nuclei of the brain that are associated with song. Uh, song learning and song production. The relative size of the circles indicate the relative size uh, uh, that they uh, exist on average in the uh, between the sexes. Uh, some of the big players here include the HVC high vocal center, the RA, the robust nucleus of the archistriatum, the LMAN lateral magnocellular nucleus of the anterior neostriatum and a nucleus that's simply called area X which is important for song development and activating songs you can see it's completely absent in the typical female zebra fringe brain now you don't have to memorize these um, acronyms for these areas uh, but you should know that there are sex differences between the zebra fringe brain that revolve around the song learning and song production system. Uh, these areas tend to be uh, larger in the male brain. Here an illustration here of actual staining. Um, this uh, the black arrows are pointing to the RA, the robust nucleus of the archistriatum. Circled here on the left is a typical male zebra finch brain and on the right is a typical female zebra finch brain um, the activation of song um, is due to uh, sex steroid hormones um, it's due to androgens like testosterone as well as estrogens you can see stained here uh, in this uh, uh, HVC, the high vocal center, within a male brain. We can see that sort of dark brownish staining is highlighting uh, uh, neurons that have androgen and estrogen receptors. And so these vocal centers of the brain are just chock full of, of receptors for for sex steroid hormones. Um, and this is the case throughout the entire brain, those areas that are responsible for song learning um, and are responsible for um, the production of song. Um, most of it is androgen receptors but in the high vocal center, we have estrogen and est uh, androgen and estrogen receptors. Now, in this paper, um, characteristics of song, brain anatomy, and blood androgen levels in spontaneously singing female canaries. So, there are natural phenomena that occur in which every now and then um, a female canary will um, learn song and sing. <coughs> <coughs> will sing, um, which is a male typical um, behavior during the breeding season. Very rarely do we see female songbirds that sing. 
Now, um, this is a, a, a male right here, a typical male canary. Uh, this is a domesticated canary, so these are pets. These are this. You can go buy a canary at the pet store. And nearly 100% of males of domesticated canaries sing. This is one of the reasons why they've been domesticated, because humans um, have enjoyed their song so much that they want to keep them in a cage and hear them sing whenever they want. So let's listen to this male. delightful and charming song there from our male canary. Now let's take a look at a female canary that sings. <coughs> About 5% of our female domesticated canaries will sing. So listen to this, um, juxtaposing it to what you just heard from them. Now, uh, an equally charming and delightful song from our female canary. So, if androgens are playing a part here in activating this song, then we have a nice little uh, natural experiment. We can compare non-singing females to singing females. Um, to see if they have larger circulating levels of testosterone, uh, larger, co higher concentrations. And we can also take a look at their neuroanatomy to see if they have singing nuclei uh, that are different. We would expect the singing females, perhaps, to have neuroanatomy and endocrine hormone levels more closely resembling males uh, than typical females. <coughs> uh, taking a look here, we can see both the HVC volume, the high vocal center, and the robust nucleus of the archaea striatum are both larger than females that sing. And in uh, androgen levels, we see that they are significantly higher uh, in singing females than non-singing females. Uh, don't get uh, misled here by uh, the scale. These box plots for the testosterone concentrations look very similar, uh, but there's little overlap in the distribution. Uh, and you can imagine expanding the y-axis. This uh, really isn't a, a very good um, 
Um, this is a good example of how not to make a graph. Uh, this y-axis should be expanded that a uh, uh, zero um, should come all the way down to the x-axis uh, to better show uh, the spread. Uh, but on average here, it looks like uh, our concentrations in the non-singing females are hovering around perhaps 0 0.04, 0 0.035 nanograms per mil. And those that are singing looks like they're the, the mean, um, actually these box plots, the black bar shows the median, are perhaps uh, 0 0.08 or 0 0.09. So, uh, at least twice as concentrated in our singing females. Now, in another paper, more recently, exploring a song in females in the European robin. So, as before, uh, when I talked about um, the bird song being sort of a male exclusive behavior and feature. Actually, we're finding out um, here quite recently um, that uh, birdsong in females is much more widespread and perhaps evolutionarily, ecologically important uh, or significant. Um, and, and, and so we're sort of discovering as we're, you know, making more and closer observations that for many of our species sort of been ignored or just not picked up on that many of our f many of our species females will also uh, sing as well now uh, they don't sing nearly to um, the level or complexity that we see in males and we're still figuring out exactly what the functional significance of the female song is whereas males it's pretty clear the vast majority of its utility is in territorial uh, display to ward off potential rivals, competitors for mates, uh, and also to attract potential mates. Uh, but with females, it's less well known. But we know that they do it for many species, including the European robin. And it seems to be seasonal, like in the males. And so this experiment was the first experiment done in uh, non-domesticated species. So before, similar things had been done in the canary, but not in a wild individual. So these were wild, free-living European robins that were captured and brought into captivity for a short period of time. And they were given um, testosterone implants. So little capsules that, that slowly, relatively slowly secrete testosterone over the course of about a week and a half or two weeks. Uh, and so taking a look here at the graph first on the left, this is a, a little weird, but it's three-dimensional. The y-axis is our um, singing activity, so the higher up the dots, the more singing they're doing. Each row of dots uh, along the x-axis, which isn't labeled or ticked at all, these are just different individuals. In the z-axis, which is all the way on the right that goes from negative 10 to 10, is days before and after the testosterone implant. And so we can see at day zero, we see a significant increase in song activity for those individuals that are the black dots. These are the individuals given the testosterone. Uh, the open circles are uh, uh, matched control individuals that were given a sham. They were given an implant with no testosterone. And you can see that the ones giving the testosterone are, are experiencing a dramatic increase in singing activity. Um, so there seems to be some already neural architecture in place in the females that if they're exposed to high levels of testosterone, they will induce singing um, which is somewhat surprising given what was previously thought uh, and also um, observed and studied in other species like the zebra finch uh, in which testosterone will not induce singing in females. Uh, this is sort of as a side, this is a good testament to why um, 
you have to be careful when making f inferences from model organisms that have a long history of uh, domestication and have been removed from the evolutionary pressures and their ecological context. Um, sometimes things that uh, relationships that you find in the laboratory may not accurately reflect uh, the true relationships uh, that you would find in free living organisms that are found within their ecologically and evolutionarily relevant contexts. This is a great example of that. By studying our uh, domesticated bird species became a way of thinking that, well, the females can't sing, even if you give them testosterone. This is certainly not the case. And so this goes back to uh, um, thinking, thinking again about our conceptual models of the organization of the nervous system due to androgens or estrogens or both. Um, B, C, and D are uh, three panels, sonograms, visual representation of their song. The female's giving a whisper song, which is a, a male, <coughs> a male typical song seven days after the testosterone implant, and then a, a full song given by a female 11 days after the testosterone implant. And then below, for reference, a typical male song. Um, so the sonograms are uh, strikingly similar. Um, much, much, this uh, uh, C panel, the female song, is much more um, closely resembling the male song uh, than any vocalization that this European robin female would be making without the T implant. Uh, in this study, too, they uh, uh, also found that the females treated with T had, uh, at the end of the study, uh, at the end of just a, a couple of weeks, had larger high vocal centers, um, or HVC nuclei, in their brains. Uh, and so this demonstrates uh, a certain level of plasticity over the uh, over the course of just a few weeks uh, that sex steroids can impose on neural architecture. So there's a certain amount of very plastic and rapid organizational effects happening here as well. All right, and I've uh, I've colored or I've outlined them here so that it's easier um, easier to see. Uh, the white arrows uh, from the original figures and the top blue stained ones uh, indicate the area, and I've just outlined them in red. And you can see that the T-treated individuals, their nuclei are larger. Okay, we'll stop here for the second half of our endocrine lecture.